welcome everybody. Um, my name is Mary Caldor and I'm the chair of this very interesting session we're about to have, the new authoritarianism as a global phenomenon. Um, we're going to talk about a new book by Luke Cooper, who's going to start, um, who's my colleague and who's written a really interesting book called Authoritarian Contagion. And he's tried to get at what the new authoritarianism or new right-wing populism that we talk about uh, consists of. So we'll use his book as a starting point, but I think it's an opportunity really to have a discussion about what does COVID mean? Or what do the times we're living through, the crises we're living through mean for authoritarianism? On the one hand, I think it's an existential crisis where people's lives are at risk and how governments act really matters. And in that sense, authoritarianism that fails to deliver is already being discredited as we saw in the case of Donald Trump. And we're seeing in the case of Bolsonaro, we're seeing in the case of Modi. But on the other hand, the sort of experience of lockdown, the economic situation, which Anne will talk about, there's a sort of psych mad psychology in the air, the anti-vaxxers and others, that makes me very, very nervous. And, and you add to that the wars in places like Syria and Afghanistan, the pressures of refugees, and, it's, and the results of climate change disasters. And it's quite an alarming situation. So let's discuss these issues, these big issues, and we'll start with Luke Cooper, who's going to tell us a bit about his book and his ideas. Great. Uh, thanks, uh, Mary. And it's uh, so good to see uh, so many people here today. Um, so, yeah, as Mary said, I've recently uh, published a book, Authoritarian Contagion, and it's a great opportunity to uh, talk about it today. And there's going to be lots of time for questions from the audience as well that we can try to grapple with. And in the presentation, I just want to give at the start, I'll get, explain some of the background to writing the book, uh, introduce some of the key ideas and arguments, not all of it, obviously, and discuss some examples and cases. In fundamentally, the book is really about ideology and ideology's changing relationship or the chain or the or its relationship to the changing political sociology and economy of our world. Um, it draws from an intellectual tradition associated with the Italian Marxist Antonio Gramsci and particularly his account of hegemony. That just refers to how uh, political actors in a society will seek leadership and it's often associated with attempts to change the rules of the game, to upset the normal, um, to try to change a society's uh, direction. And the book engages with some ideas of Gramscian writers after Gramsci, if you like, people like Stuart Hall or Chantal Mouffe that many people in the audience might well have heard of. And it began its life, this project, in earnest in 2018, um, when I started researching authoritarianism in Europe. Prior to this, I had studied the democracy movement in Hong Kong, and so I had encountered their shifts that were already underway in China and uh, in mainland China too, under Xi Jinping. Something that I also return to and discuss in the book, trying to build a comparison um, with the U what has happened in the US under Trump for all their uh, huge uh, differences. And one of the things that conclusions that I came to um, is that there really are, it's quite strikingly similar, a very early stage that I came to. It's really, there's a, a series of surprising resemblances, surprising because countries that have very different political and economic um, conditions, very different institutions often, and nonetheless are also generating politics which you know look quite similar and uses many of the similar many similar arguments. And 
there's a kind of authoritarian playbook that has emerged and is we find all over the place and I'll discuss it um, I'll discuss it more in a moment but it can really attach itself to really quite diverse institutional forms quite diverse types of economics and um, but use similar mobilizing uh, discourses and so it's super widespread um, from prosperous but declining great powers middle-income countries, low-income countries, as Mary emphasised in her introduction, and I don't talk about this enough in the book, um, I think it's an area of, of future work, but we also see this similar politics, I think, in conflict in societies that were experiencing steep and intractable uh, conflict, and we also see it amongst new and rising uh, powers in the global order too. So what's at the root of these shifts and how should we analyse it? Well, one article that influenced me a lot was a piece by an academic from Yale called Milan uh, Sovlik in the Journal of Democracy. Now, I don't actually agree with the article, but it encouraged me to think more about things. And I think it played a role in you know, helping me to, to come to the conclusions that I did. And the article that I would recommend reading is called Polarization Against Democracy. Now, I don't actually agree with how he casts the issue. I don't think the problem here is polarization. But where I think he has a point and something that I try to develop in the book is on this role of partisanship in authoritarian discourse. So what do I mean by that? Um, well, basically, I introduced the idea of authoritarian protectionism to describe how if you convince a member of the public, a member of the citizenry, that they are facing a fundamental attack on their interests and identity, then that's a very powerful mobilizing device in politics. And it means that if that particular member of the public um, is convinced of this argument, that their fundamental interests are really threatened, that their identity is threatened, then they might be inclined to support attacks on democracy if they uh, think that those attacks will be helpful to protect their interests from what they've been told is an existential uh, threat. And I think the new authoritarianism uses this argument and has used it really effectively all over the world, as I said. And it takes a series of steps that I talk about um, in the book. First of all, you, and they're quite simple steps, uh, and I think, but I think it does hold it all together in a way. First of all, you define the insider group as ethnically homogenous in one way or another. And usually this will involve equating the nation with an ethnic majority, like uh, white people in the UK, for example. And this may be done explicitly, or more often than not, it's done in some kind of coded, implicit uh, way, where, in a, where you send out smoke signals for what you really mean without explicitly advocating a form of white supremacism. And then the second step, as I mentioned, well, then you need to claim that the group is at risk. And so serious are these attacks that you have to do anything, including eroding or limiting the rule of law and democracy to protect the majority from the forces that are veiled against, railed against it, may be that migrants or be that a cosmopolitan or allegedly cosmopolitan elites. And then I think there's also a third thing. You don't always see this. Um, but you, you sometimes have this idea of a great civilizational crisis, a now or never struggle. And this is something that Donald Trump in the US utilized very consistently uh, from his inauguration uh, speech on the White House steps to his response to the Black Lives Matter uh, movement. Um, and it drew it, there was this idea that America was on its knees, that America was facing at this nadir and that only Trump uh, could protect the American people from all these awful forces that are railed against its um, interests, this real crisis of civilization. And uh, that does, and I think especially with Trump, it, Trump, it um, really drew from the well of traditional fascist uh, discourses. I can't hear you, Luke. Luke. 
has your sound gone? Can anyone hear me? Yeah, you can hear me, everybody, but we can't hear Luke. I can't hear you at all, Luke. Um, Luke, can you hear us? Can you hear us, Luke? No. Oh, I heard Me something. Now? Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. Sorry. I think I think I might have knocked the microphone, but I'll, and that upset it. Um, so I, I I don't know how much you uh, missed, but I was basically saying that um, Trump drew very directly from. A, a, a well of narrative that we associate with the traditional fascist far right um, and that's this idea of the civilizational crisis and for the traditional fascist far right it involves and fa thankfully Trump didn't quite say this but many of his supporters did uh, and the idea of a coming race war uh, between whites and uh, non-whites. Now this discourse um, also normally involves some kind of patriarchal set of arguments denoting a male leader that acts as the nation's protector and saviour and advancing a picture of the nation that supports usually traditional status distinctions between men and women. Now overall I really think that this playbook is very common including in China under Xi Jinping where Han Chinese nationalism has really run out of control over the last decade and been used to justify genocide in Xinjiang and to take sweeping steps to close down uh, what political freedoms um, existed uh, through the creation of a technological surveillance state and the crushing of uh, democracy uh, in Hong Kong. We also see something similar in Hungary where Orban uh, could not have been clearer that the nation, the Hungarian nation, belongs to white Christian hung Hungarians and Muslim immigrants are out to destroy it uh, in, uh, in collaboration with a European cosmopolitan uh, liberal elite. And I think we also have a softer uh, but no less real form of this in the UK, uh, where the Brexit referendum was won through mobilising highly racialized uh, narratives regarding non-white immigration, particularly from Syria, or through the claim uh, Turkey would join the EU. It still hasn't happened, by the way, in case you haven't noticed. And um, we also see today that there are quite significant um, attacks on the rule of law underway from voter suppression to academic freedom to limiting access uh, to judicial review to undermining the right to protest and through explicitly challenging uh, international refugee uh, law. So uh, I think by casting this as very common, of course, it does raise challenges for how we go about explaining it. If you're saying, if I'm saying that this is quite a general phenomena, it's inevitably going to be different from one country to the next. And we might end up being unsatisfied with attempts to build a super universal explanation that makes very big causal claims uh, for why it's happening. If that's presented as a kind of con as an alternative to a concrete analysis of particular examples. But with that caveat aside, and I'll finish uh, on this. I think the commonality we find in the language of the new authoritarian right does help us to think about some of the general causes. And this comes back to what Mary said in her introduction, um, that societies are experiencing, I think, heightened systemic risk. Uh, what Joe Biden in his uh, inauguration speech referred to as the cascading crises of our time, a package of disruptions from accelerating global inequality to technological change, to climate meltdown, to racial injustice. And the effects of those changes are not um, at all felt even, evenly between particular 
geographies and places or between particular individuals clearly. Um, but broadly, if we were to sum up those shifts in one label, I think we could say that there's a package of changes uh, that reflect the crisis and end times of, of neoliberalism. And, and what's happening with authoritarianism shows that you know, what comes after neoliberalism isn't necessarily superior to the system itself. And I think you're seeing, and I'm sure Anne will, I'll, I'll invite Anne to say more about this. You know, we have a traditional economic elite who have now become heavily dependent on state support. And how do they justify that? They can't use traditional neoliberal arguments to justify uh, that support and subsidy for capital from the state, which is happening in myriad of different um, ways. Well, one, one mechanism that they have available is to turn to and utilize fear. And in the context of these mounting real and imagined uh, crisis, clearly the political potency of the idea of ethnic protection is very attractive for parts of the global uh, and national elite who are vulnerable to demands for more sweeping uh, structural change. So that's my uh, snapshot analysis of what I think is happening. Thank you very much, Luke. And I'm kind of wondering whether people go on believing in authoritarian protection when they find that the authoritarians are no longer protecting them. I mean, it is so striking how deep rooted the Trump supporters are, even though they're not getting any, many of the benefits that they were promised. Anyway, with that thought, I will now turn to Professor Priyamvada Gopal, who is Professor of Postcolonial Studies at Cambridge University. And I'm really looking forward to what she has to say. Thank you, uh, Mary. Uh, I want to start by congratulating uh, Luke on uh, this book. Um, it is what I would call a high res snapshot of our global uh, present. It's pithy uh, without sacrificing rigor. It's um, well researched and yet very readable. It's usefully comparative. Um, in ways that I think we need to be. Uh, none of the contexts that Luke discusses um, can or should be seen in isolation. Um, and certainly Modi, Orban, Kaczynski, Duterte, uh, Bolsonaro, Trump. And one might add, um, I think, Erdogan. Um, I, do, I do wonder where Erdogan fits into, into this um, uh, gallery. Um, I think it is important to talk about them uh, in relation to each other, even though there are, as Luke notes, there are some interesting differences as well in mode of operation. Um, Luke identifies G in a sense as the as the anomaly. I mean, he's the only one who functions in a formally non-democratic system. And what is very striking is that all the others um, have emerged out of liberal democracies. And that, in a sense, is what should concern us and what I think the book invites us to be concerned about. The book seeks to analyze the rise of authoritarian practices as a form of hegemonic politics. I'm, I'm citing from it here. And Gramsci is put to very good use. Uh, Luke notes that Trump encapsulates this, uh, this um, authoritarian practices as a sort of form of he hegemony. Um, but actually, to my mind, Trump is a relative newcomer. He's a, a relative latecomer uh, to the party, um, even if he was uh, what Luke calls an astute practitioner uh, in all his crudity, um, uh, an astute practitioner of this kind of politics of um, purely self-interested power as the basis of national identification. Uh, for me, uh, certainly personally, uh, the alarm bells rang very, very loudly in 2014 um, when uh, Modi was elected uh, to, to power and he's of course won uh, elections yet again. Um, one thing I, I think we might usefully talk about is the distinction perhaps between hegemony and dominance. Um, are these contexts where authoritarianism is hegemonic or on the way to hegemony? Because the other thing, of course, is there are very sharp divides uh, 
um, in all, nearly all, I would say, of, of these contexts. And there is a battle still underway. I, you know, I, I don't know how the battle will pan out, uh, but certainly India and the USA um, and indeed uh, Turkey, uh, these are the contexts I know reasonably well, um, are sharply divided. And so is it is it yet hegemonic? Or is it on its way to hegemony? Is it is it dominant uh, rather than hegemonic? Um, Luke notes um, that the tensions uh, between what he calls the language and practice of democracy, um, in one sense, of course, these are not new. Um, Luke, I think, rightly invites us to, to think about the changes in the present, but I'm also struck by certain continuities. Um, and I think that we are at a point where we need to ask fairly searching questions about what democracy that is actually existing democracy has done or not done, right? And we do need to pose the question, uh, and not just because of these seeming eruptions uh, in a time of monsters, uh, but really something else Luke draws our attention to, uh, it, it, which is true, I think, across these contexts, it's what he calls the absence of substantive empowerment. And this is something that is really concerning. Why is it that, you know, uh, decades into formal democracy, substantive um, empowerment is missing and so profoundly missing? Uh, why is it that we are witnessing what looks like the dwindling of democracies into majoritarianism? Because the authoritarianism, yes, it comes with a high degree of consent, but it is also often just raw numbers, um, and it is it is it is brute force um, at the ballot box, the brute force uh, of numbers. And given the identification in this book that Luke makes of very very profound and constitutive inequalities, the very concerning question for me is: Is substantive empowerment even possible? Um, it does, does, does the economic system in which these multiple liberal democracies have dwindled into majoritarianism and authoritarianism, does it even allow for substantive empowerment? And if not, what needs to be done? Um, the third point I want to make um, is, again, going back to this point, um, Luke says that part um, that, that freedom loving peoples or thinking of oneself as being part of freedom loving peoples uh, can actually uh, veil anti-democratic actions. In one sense, though, this also is not new. This, certainly in post-colonial contexts, has always been the case that democracy made its grand entrance on the back of empire. And what empire put in place was a profoundly centralized state. Um, and it, 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 and I'm thinking here clearly of the Indian case that uh, historians like Gyan Prakash have written about recently in the context of Indira Gandhi's emergency and what some people call the undeclared emergency that India is undergoing now. And the point is, what, what is the continuity here? The continuity is the fact that the state never changed. The apparatus of the state was repressive and authoritarian. It allowed for, you know, the vote, it allowed for the ballot box, but you were, you inherited, post-colonial India inherited a deeply centralized state with easy repressive mechanisms to hand, right? So the legal apparatus, and of course the most salient example of that is the liberal use of the sedition law. And the sedition law uh, came along with the apparatus of empire and has basically functioned more or less um, unchanged. So I think we do need to think about the startling compatibility of authoritarianism and democracy. Uh, in a sense, it's a, it's a polarity in our heads, but it's a, it's a very shaky polarity. Why is it that, that liberal democracies um, have been so welcoming, hospitable uh, to authoritarianism, to the cult of personality, to um, heavy repression um, and deep consensual xenophobia. 
Um, the term authoritarian protectionism, uh, I think, is a, is a lovely term. But of course, again, this was precisely the premise of the imperial state that the imperial state was a father and a mother, and it would protect, and it was, um, it, it offered trusteeship, it offered um, uh, paternalism. Uh, in Hindi, it's called maibap, uh, the, the state as mother and, and father. Um, and then finally, as I, as I sort, of, sort of start to wind down, I think we need to also think, when we think about the relationship of liberalism and democracy, we do need to go back to thinking about liberalism and empire uh, in the sense that liberalism has from its inception been riven by tensions uh, which are at once come from responding to resistance and being responsive to resistance and on the other hand helping to consolidate rule and, and the two things have gone hand in hand. Um, I know Anne will talk about this some more, but really, I think the interesting question in the book that we could talk about a lot more is what are the economics of authoritarian uh, protectionism? Uh, and as Luke points out, these different contexts vary uh, in relation to redistributive uh, goals. Um, but I think Luke raises an important point, you know, rather than addressing the structural causes of crises, authoritarianism, authoritarian protectionism finds respite in bitter grievance. Um, it's an astonishingly simple and crude formula, but it has worked really brilliantly uh, to tell people, actually, it's not neoliberalism or capitalism, which is responsible for your misery, it's the migrant next door. Um, and it is, it is that crude and it is that powerful. And it has allowed generations really of um, billionaires and uh, millionaires and billionaires to pass themselves off as um, somehow uh, subaltern. Look, I mean, one last question I have for you is you you do talk about um, how in your in your opinion, the nation state is not necessarily programmed for self-interest. Um, I have to say that I probably 10 years ago, I would have agreed with you and I would have said, yes, you can have a, a, a progressive, emancipatory, uh, liberating nation state. And obviously, as a post-colonialist, I, I engage with that question a lot. But I have to say, watching what is happening in post-colonial states, not least um, India, I am now increasingly thinking of the nation state form as a poisoned chalice um, that actually in very deep ways, it seems to be constitutively turned towards xenophobia and recolonization that you know we, we are witnessing the colonization colonization of populations within the borders of the nation state finally where does hope lie there is some opposition uh, there there is some dissent um, is this going to go anywhere and who who is going to challenge uh, this project of authoritarian protectionism which may not even be protectionism at the end of the day uh, who is going to challenge this, um, you know, this Goliath uh, that is unfolding across the globe. So I will leave it there and congratulations once again. Thanks, Priya. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Priya. And you're absolutely right about the centrality of the issue of substantive empowerment. In our research group at LSC, we did a little study of uh, how people thought in leave areas and it was clear the real frustration was the feeling that their voices were never heard and what I agree with you that the problem is the centralized state and if I think about it in the case of the UK or the US I think a huge problem is the historical link between the state and militarism and the deeply held ideas about what, how militarism is somehow intrinsic to the state, which is kind of linked to a sort of rigidity of the state. But I think that's not the only issue. I think the other issue which both Trump and Johnson played on is of course globalization. It is the fact that even 
if your democracy is perfect. It's easier in India because it's larger. But in somewhere like the UK, the fact that the decisions that affect our lives are taken in financial markets or in the headquarters of multinational corporations means even if we didn't have a centralized paternalistic state, uh, we still have the problem. Um, and, you know, I think we see, I mean, we've all, Luke and I and, I and Anne have all been very preoccupied with issues of to do with Brexit and the European Union. And I think the real problem is the mismatch between uh, the economy and society and our political arrangements. And if there's hope, it has to be for changing those political arrangements. Anyway, I'm the chair, so I won't go on, but I think I've made a good segue to Anne <laughs> because I know she's going to talk about some of these issues. Oh, and I should introduce you, Anne. Uh, this is everybody, oh. Anne Pettifer, who may be well known to everybody. She's a political economist and she's written a wonderful book called The Case for a Green New Deal and she ran Jubilee 2000 and she's been an activist who's been very inspiring. <laughs> Thank you very, very much, um, Mary. And thank you also uh, to Luke for his book and for his very clear um, uh, enunciation of, of the, as he says, the concrete examples of authoritarianism in different states and, and how devastating that is to human civilization. Um, so I'm, I'm really pleased uh, that he's published this and that he's made very explicit um, the extent and the depth of um, of authoritarianism in so many states. And I want to uh, look at this from an economic perspective, and I'm going to be largely Polanyan in my perspective. And I am probably going to disagree uh, with Professor Gopal on the question of the nation state. For me, the nation state still is um, uh, the decisive economic and political unit uh, for, for democracies. Um, it's the bulwark against uh, what I, recall, I rec regard as financial globalization. And, and in a regressive way and in, uh, a, 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 in a centralized and authoritarian way, yes. But I, I want us to come back to that subject and, and tease it out a little bit more, if I may. But I want to begin by just uh, reminding everybody where we are right now. You know, we have uh, a global economy which is has been constructed, if you like, as this gargantuan automaton, right? So that we've had long stretched supply lines uh, designed, if, if, if I may say so, uh, as a way of reducing labor costs and increasing profits and capital gains. Uh, for the owners of, of the world's assets, essentially. So this extraordinary system of production, manufacturing and consumption is, as we speak, falling apart, basically. Um, we find that um, there are breaks across the board on supply lines caused by the pandemic, caused by climate breakdown, caused by labour shortages, caused by... Um, resistance, if you like, to, to the system. And this is beginning, this breakdown is going to worsen. There's no doubt about that. Um, and, and it's partly a reason for some of the rise in protectionism. But I would like to begin by arguing that the whole of protectionism, national protectionism, is a reaction to the removal of control over markets from governments, from societies, from democratic governments, and transferred to invisible and unaccountable capital markets, namely Wall Street, increasingly Wall Street. The world is governed by what Daniela Gabor calls the Wall Street consensus, and, and uh, the city of London and Frankfurt, uh, to name but a few, right? And it's this remote and unaccountable and invisible management of the global economy 
to which there is this fantastic resistance. This in, and the resistance takes an entirely regressive and reactionary form. It takes the form of protectionism. Protect me from these forces beyond my control. And explains, in my view, the rise of authoritarians. So in the United States, it, were, it was those in the Rust Belt who've lost their jobs, whose children cannot get to university, that, who cannot afford to a roof over their heads, uh, who live in, in, in dire insecurity states of dire insecurity, economic and otherwise, who turn to a strong man, and it's invariably a man, for protection from these market forces, as Polanyi argued. And um, for me, the, the, the question of addressing that nationalism, that authoritarianism, uh, that protectionism, is addressing the, the whole international financial system, which is an automaton, which is expected to operate in a self-regulating way without any oversight, democratic or otherwise. And, and the reaction has been pretty much as was it was in the 1930s and in the 1920s to the rise, as, as, you, as um, Professor Gopal has, has mentioned, to the rise of imperialism in, in the 19th century, which in turn, you know, it spread the, uh, the uh, automatic nature of the market across the world. So um, until we understand that, it really, in my view, is going to be very difficult to, to respond to the rise in nationalism. And I would want to argue that, that we have to first of all understand that the international financial system operating in the way that it does um, strips nations, strips societies, strips governments of power. You know, we effectively are governed by Wall Street. You know, Wall Street decides on the exchange rate of our currencies, on the interest rate that we'll pay on our debts, foreign or domestic, on, on whether or not f capital will flow across borders or not flow away, flow in, in the direction of a country. And finally, on whether or not corporations will pay taxes. And the fact that, you know, thanks to capital mobility, corporations can avoid paying taxes in itself undermines the nation state and increases its de defensiveness, in my view. So when we look at it from that perspective, what we see is that the, re the reactionary response to globalization, to financial globalization, which I call the internationalization of the interests of wealth, essentially, the interests of the 1%. This is an international financial system that serves the interests of the 1%. I think that we have to argue for a new kind of internationalism. Instead of supporting globalization, because globalization embodies this new financial system, we should be supporting a new kind of internationalism of the 99%. That internationalism in the sense of an internationalism that requires coordination and cooperation. Um, and it's the absence of that kind of internationalism, which in my view, reinforces nationalism uh, because countries are, are, are on their own. There's nothing, you know, if you're, if you're um, the country of my birth, South Africa, and you need a vaccine, there is no international coordination that is going to support uh, the acquisition of vaccines to deal with a, a, a pandemic in South Africa. It's up to each country to fight its corner for some access to something, to a life-saving drug right, thanks to the construction of the international financial system. So, so in my view, you know, while, while it's absolutely correct to describe this authoritarianism for what it is, which is racist, which is reactionary, which is protectionist, uh, and which is profoundly illiberal, nevertheless, the way to respond to it is to understand that we need to change, first of all, transform the international system. And I've, I find this very difficult for the left, broadly defined, to discuss the international system. There is a preoccupation with the national domestic economy and a kind of blind spot for the fact that all domestic economies, all uh, economies are dominated and, uh, by an international system, 
over which we have countries and, and societies have very, very little influence or control. And until we dismantle that system, until we dispossess Wall Street, we really are going to find this sort of reaction. And Polanyi explained it very well in the 1930s, explained very well the rise of fascism and of Nazism and of Hitler as being people seeking protection from invisible financial economic forces which stripped them of power and and therefore sought the protection invariably of a strong man and it's striking to me that all the dictators mentioned in uh, Luke's book are men basically and all men pretending to be as, uh, strong when in fact the one thing they will not tackle is the the absolute cause of of um, this reaction which is the construction of the international financial system designed to serve the interests of the 1%. And so I would like to incorporate that discussion about the international system into this discussion about protectionism, because I, I think they're profoundly linked. Um, and it's really important for us to see those linkages and to understand that what markets are trying to do is to commodify, if you like, uh, fictitious commodities, i.e. labor, land, and money, and by doing so to strip societies of power over, over land, labor, land, and money. And what we need most of all in a democracy is power over labor, land, and money, and management of that. So I want to stop at that point, but I hope that we can bring that international financial system into the discussion about the rise of authoritarianism. And like Professor Gopal, I'd like to thank Luke again for his really important intervention with this book. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anne. And I completely agree with you that we really need to talk about the international system and we need to talk about governance beyond the nation state. But I just wonder your defense of nation states at the same time, because as long as democracy is organized on a nation state basis, yeah. there's always going to be a tendency towards authoritarian protectionism. And as long as nation states are linked to armies and militarism, I mean, I think this is the huge dilemma in the European Union that all of the individual European states find it very convenient mm. to criticize the European Union and play to domestic politics. So it seems to me we need to be also thinking about some form of transnational democracy. Mm. And what I find so, I agree with you so much, so totally shocking at the moment is the kind of lack of solidarity, whether it's with Afghans, whether it's with Syrians, uh, that we, whether it's with people who aren't getting vaccines in South Africa. This mm -hmm. seems to me really, really alarming. Yeah. Anyway, there have already been some questions to Luke. So before we take questions from the audience, Luke, do you want to respond to some of these points? Uh, yeah, well, there's some, there's some great questions from the audience as well. But yeah, thanks so much to Priya and uh, Anne, uh, that was, there's, there's so much food for thought. I mean, particularly, uh, particularly the idea of, of talking about empire and imperialism as, as actually mobilizing historically discourses that were very similar to the ones that I've described in the book and had a kind of narrative authoritarian protectionism. I was, as I was furiously uh, note-taking, um, I was thinking that there's a, there's a paper to be written right there about some of the historical lineages, because the book is very much based on the present um, day. Uh, it goes back a bit into the neoliberal era, but of course, as Priya has argued, you know, these have deep historical origins, not merely uh, contemporary or near historical um, ones. And um, I, I think on this issue that has already you know, come up in the panel of, of, of nations and nationalism, I suppose this is the, is the kind of a classic uh, debate um, or, or among, amongst the left and in wider society of you know, to what extent uh, can, can nation states be utilized as part of a democratic project? I mean, I, I tend to agree with both 
Priya and Anne on this in the sense that uh, nations, it seems to me, always have this Janus based and dual character that right. they can, they emerged historically as a series of claims about self determination, but those claims were often. Uh, often racialized in one um, way or another. It's, you know, uh, I, I sort of do some research on this um, too. I mean, it's very difficult, I'd say impossible, to separate the history of uh, nationalism in Europe and the United in, in the Americas from processes of racialization. I mean, even relatively benign examples or examples that we might see as just instances of, of, of liberal revolution, you know, the Greek uprising against the Ottoman Empire was obsessed with the idea that Greek uh, identity was a white identity to the point where uh, they even desecrated Byzantine art in order to make Greek figurines look whiter. So we can't separate these issues of racialization um, and uh, nationalism. And uh, I, I suppose I would also say nonetheless that I mean, one of the powerful things about the national idea is that broadly it means that if you share a national identity, you should be treated the same. And I think what is, to bring that on to what's happened in the neoliberal um, era, I think is quite interesting. One of the differences I discuss in the book is between Margaret Thatcher's arguments and someone like Boris Johnson. And we, I think, would, uh, in our commonsensical way, we would probably say, well, what's the difference? That, Boris Johnson almost certainly thinks of himself, I would imagine, as a supporter of Thatcher and his legacy. It would in be interesting if you ever asked him about it. But if you go back and look at uh, Thatcher's speeches, you find that she was completely obsessed with economic individualism and used arguments and terms of phrase that you could never imagine um, uh, 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 Boris Johnson using. I mean, to give you one example, after in one of her conference speeches, and I'm paraphrasing um, here, she's talked about how life in the Britain that we build will be difficult and hard, um, just as it was for previous uh, generations. And it won't be easy to get ahead. You'll have to work hard. Now, you could never imagine Boris Johnson saying that it's just it's just he's full of this sort of sunlit optimism that and I think that shows how that kind of hardline economic individualism in the West because of the effects of neoliberalism that it's not possible for everyone to get ahead it's lost its purchase as a political argument to the point where the centre right uh, won't use it um, any any more um, and so yeah I think. On, on Anne's uh, argument, yeah, I agree. I suppose just to, uh, uh, th yeah, brilliant as ever, like the, the whole analysis and um, uh, the way that it holds uh, together. I suppose what's interesting, or the question I have anyway, is, you know, a decade or so ago when the Greek crisis happened, various people, and I think this was even raised at an, uh, a stock a holders meeting, a, sh a shareholders conference of Apple, that Apple actually had enough capital at the time in cash reserves in order to bail out the entire Greek uh, national debt, that they could just buy Greece in a sense. And uh, it, this was, you know, discussed in the, in, in the public sphere as a possibility. So I just raised that because I think it illustrates this extraordinary, what you're saying in a way, that global financial markets have accumulated such extraordinary concentrations of economic power that it means that they could, could, could buy, buy entire countries. I suppose the caveat on that analysis is that that doesn't appear to be the direction that we're heading in. And if there's hope with what's happening in the structures of the global economy, the breakdown, uh, you described, it probably is that it actually gives opportunities to for states and democracy to reassert their power against financial markets in various ways. Oh dear, I, you may be right, but it's so worrying when you see how powerful the financial system has become, the defence industry has become, and so difficult it is for states, certainly smaller states, to assert their power. Now, we've got lots and lots of really good questions. And um, 
I'm, I'm going to leave the first question, which is about the people who buy into authoritarianism and come back to that later, because it's a very good question. Uh, and it's been partly answered, I think, by both Luke and Anne. But I'm now going to ask the question anybody can reply, the next one, which is what does the new social, what role does the new social media play? I think this is obviously a question we've all debated, but I think it's interesting to think about whether the change in the form of communication makes authoritarianism a different phenomenon than similar episodes of authoritarianism in the past. I don't know who, which of you would like to start on that one. It's probably an obvious one for Luke, although I want meant to go to Priya and... Well, Priya has lots of experience of uh, this phenomenon on social media, not in a good way, so I'd be interested to hear her thoughts. Yeah. Okay, well, let's both of you. Why don't you start, Priya? Oh, um, just to say that for me, I think that ties up with uh, the question of substantive empowerment in the sense that what social media has enabled, uh, again, there's a, there's a degree of continuity alongside change, um, is the very fast proliferation of fake news um, and, and a complete decimation on, of anything resembling critical thinking and the education that necessarily goes alongside democracy. We have, uh, you know, democracies which sit on a bedrock of a great number of falsehoods. Um, and it isn't that these didn't exist before social media. Uh, it, you know, the, the, the three billionaires who own the press were pretty good at you know uh, disseminating fake news, but social media has added to that, and what it has added to is of course um, a great deal of of poison. So xenophobia and hate can circulate at a much much faster rate uh, than before. But that's my very kind of superficial take on the situation. And and I just like to add that you know these are the companies that own these social media outlets are again beyond the reach of um, regulatory democracy, with for all its weaknesses, but they've been designed to be beyond the reach of regulatory democracy, and as long as we tolerate that, we're tolerating the power that they exercise, um, while complaining about it. So. Um, that brings me back to how do we manage that? How do we manage those, those big corporate, powerful corporations? Facebook is now very powerful, billionaires, uh, owned by billionaires, um, but beyond the reach of any, any government, uh, any state, any, any democratic state anyway, um, but designed to be that. So we have to look at that design in my view to change things. Yeah, there's so much to say, but I'll go on to the next question and other people can come back in. And the next question is, how does the EU uh, or the successors of Macron and Merkel, one of which, by the way, might be Marine Le Pen, and does that mean the first woman authoritarian protectionism or will she be different? Sorry, I've thrown in a separate question. But how do they deal with authoritarianism in the block, will Hungary be expelled? It's an obvious one for Luke. And Hungary if you won't want to add on social media. I'm afraid. Um, <laughs> whether, that, whether that's the desirable outcome, I'm, I'm not so sure. I don't, I don't think Hungary should be expelled. What I do certainly think is that the EU's record on these issues, when they had a chance to be much stronger at the beginning of the last decade now has been absolutely atrocious. And the reason for that is that we tend to hone in on the, the big high profile examples that everyone talks about. So that's the Polish re regime of Kaczynski and uh, the, uh, the Hungarian re regime of Viktor Orban. And certainly I think the tendencies that we talk about, I talk about in the book are much more um, developed there. But if we cast this authoritarianism 
a bit more broadly and we talk and well not necessarily much more broadly we talk about say anti-semitism and soros conspiracies we talk about racialization and extreme racist responses to the 2015 uh, migration um, crisis and i think well we i haven't mentioned it today i just mentioned it in the book a bit but i think crony capitalism be interested in Anne's thoughts on this is a really big part of this phenomena and reflects an, a polit an economics of rent and corruption take those three facets there's a simple reason that the eu hasn't been stronger and that's because those three facets aren't just found in hungary and poland but exist i mean all over the place i mean i, I can put a link to it in the comments i did a report a few months ago for LSE ideas that was looking at political developments over the last decade in uh, Slovakia, in Romania, um, in uh, in the Czech Republic. I mean, uh, Andrzej Babis, in the Czech Prime Minister, for example. I mean, he, he's presents he presents himself as a centrist and a populist. But if you look at his the narratives around refugees and migration and so on, it's indistinguishable uh, from the radical right. Robert Fico in Slovakia was a social democrat, a member of the Party of European um, Socialists, but was extremely corrupt and used the same Soros conspiracies, same uh, civilizational you know, anti-Muslim rhetoric that we find elsewhere. So the reason that the EU, I'm not excusing the EU, I'm just saying that these there's a there's there is a factor here which the politics over the last decade has been much wider than maybe our international sort of gaze has not didn't give enough attention to can can i just say this you know i first of all i want to just make very clear that um you know i'm not uh, i'm not in support of <laughs> i'm not a nationalist i grew up under a col colonial state a colonized state, um, South Africa, that was both nationalist uh, in, in its emergence from colonialism and uh, racist. And so, you know, my whole life is dedicated to uh, never allowing such a state to exist again, to, to increasing democracy and, and the empowerment, the substantive empowerment of citizens. But if you look at the European Union, and it's very clear, in my view, to, it's, it's very easy to understand why we get these reactions. And that is because the European Union was designed in the first place, and it's, it's so clear in the way it's structured, to be a monetary system first and foremost. The point about the, 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 the European Union is that it is just a monetary system. It's not both a monetary and fiscal system. It, it's just a monetary system. It is just the European Central Bank and the currency. Uh, and the usual, the, the usual supports or, or bulwarks or uh, you know, backups for the currency are nation states, are governments that are collecting taxes and have tax revenues to, to, if you like, back up both the value of the currency, but also the power of the central bank. In the case of the European Union, that backup is there, but without any accountability at national level. So countries are stripped of their currencies, they're stripped of their abilities to set interest rates, and they are stripped of their ability to manage capital flows across borders, et cetera, et cetera. All of these are now, um, you know, Left with, uh, left with a, a small, tiny technocratic elite uh, based at both Frankfurt and Brussels. And no wonder there's a reaction. No wonder there's a rise in protectionism. You know, Europe is reliving the 1930s. And so, um, again, I come to the point that, uh, that really what's needed in Europe is more internationalism, more cooperation and coordination, more working together, a more support, mutual support for each other. Now, Europe began, it seemed to take tentative steps in this direction during the pandemic, when it became very clear that the health of one state is dependent on the health of all the states. Um, but actually, it, it, the logic of it is really is beyond the capacity of the financial powers that, that govern Europe. And um, and again, so we just, I just still see this rise in nationalism. If we want to deal with nationalism, we must deal with the, the lack of accountability of the monetary system, that is, that it, which is what the European Union substantially is constituted of.
to use. But the picture Anna? slightly changes. Sorry, Mary, can I can I just come in? Yeah, go ahead. Um, I think that story only works uh, for some states in the West and up to a certain point, because if you look, for instance, at the Indian context, the base for authoritarianism and nationalism overlaps with huge consent to globalization yeah. and uh, and uh, and and the and the financial system that you know uh, we agree in deprecating. Um, ditto the USA. It, I'm I'm less convinced by this argument that that everybody who backs. Uh, authoritarian protectionism has somehow been done in uh, by globalization. The, 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 the voting numbers don't pan out on, on such an easy scenario. There is certainly an element of that, but there was also huge educated middle-class white support for Trump, just as there is huge middle-class educated Hindus and other support for Modi. So it's not clear to me that it is a simple kind of protest retreat into nationalism across the board. Uh, I don't think that even pans out uh, in terms of the leave vote. Well, that assumes that the middle classes haven't been harmed by globalization. Not at all. Not at all. But they, but there is consent to that system. Certainly in the Indian context, uh, the BJP has participated very fully in the in the in the, in the financial system that we are talking about, and it has been part of its appeal. Yeah, as it was and, for Trump. Mm -hmm. And it is interesting. So, why is this the case? Um, I mean, it's obviously the case here too. The left behind, the people who were left behind by globalization were clearly a very key part. The people in the red wall, uh, the red wall seats in Britain, but also it was huge numbers of middle class conservative voters. So why have they gone in that direction? You have an explanation, Priya or. I, I think it's because of insecurity. I think there is, I think the system generates insecurity, not just economic insecurity, but all kinds of insecurity. And it's designed to do that because the more insecure we are, the more malleable we are, uh, you know, the more uh, profit can be extracted, the more capital gains can be extracted. So um, I think that's why. I, I don't, I mean, I think that the middle classes in both India and Britain and the United States have really, I mean, have felt the pain of losing where, where they are on the, in the hierarchy, if you like, the economic hierarchy, but they have suffered the costs of globalization. The only ones that haven't suffered the costs of globalization are the 1%, and they have massively gained from it. So I, I think there is, I see that as being the differential. And I think there is also another point, which is linked to your points about the EU being only a monetary system. I mean, I think it's desperately important, and this is a formal democracy point, to increase the accountability of those who lead the EU to the European population. Mm. They're just, it doesn't exist. They're bureaucrats no. at the moment. Yeah. And that is, and you know, we need much more. We have the European Parliament, but nobody take, or very few take it seriously. We need much more of a democratic public space. But anyway, that's another yeah. discussion. And I ought to go on with the questions. Do I make a suggestion? We could, um, yeah. Martin Shaw, uh, could, we could take him to answer, ask his question live, but he asked a question uh, that's very related to the book that he has out on this topic. Uh, well, that will be out shortly, and it might be interesting to hear from him. I think we can just Oh, click. that sounds great. Um, can we bring Martin Shaw in? I'm looking for Dave. Is that possible? Oh, I just noticed that there were some hands up, but well, we can just read out his question for now. Who anyway. are the hands up? I I didn't realise that. Well, we can read out. Hands. 
For, so it's for uh, Luke and Priya, especially, where does Britain fit into this pattern of the new authoritarianism? It's now the only major Western European or North American country in which a far right leaning right wing party is in power. What has caused this and what does it mean for those of us who live in the UK? We, we, it is important to take this question now because it's not exactly how you, we, we might find a positive point to finish on in uh, 20 minutes or so. Priya? Look, I was going to say you go first. All oh, right, no, I can go first. Well, look, I think, yeah, as I mentioned at the beginning, I think Boris Johnson and Brexit have to be situated in this, in this kind of, this analysis. Um, I suppose the situation in the UK and US is quite similar in, in the sense of the electoral coalitions. And I guess to engage the debate between Priya and Anne on this, you know, what I, I try to sort of I do that annoying academic thing in the book of saying in the debate over whether it is race or whether it is the socioeconomic system, I try to say basically in the book, well, I think it's both. And one of the uh, one of the arguments that I, I try to develop and make is that, look, you know, centre right parties like the Republican Party and like the Conservative Party here have always had a very big and predominantly and still do middle class base of support. It, you know, their, 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 their natural core support comes from the middle classes. So mm -hmm. what so it would be very it's in a way it's asking the wrong question to say, well, do, is there the majority of their support still from the middle classes? Because you're asking a question that you kind of know the answer. I mean, there would have to be some kind of huge change for anything different to happen. Um, but what has been significant is that they have expanded that electorate significantly uh, into the working class. Um, Hillary, in 2016, uh, Hillary Clinton's support uh, was amongst white, non-college educated, uh, working class voters, was at the lowest level for 60 years um, or, or, or in a presidential election. So it was hugely lower. And I mean, in this country, I think there's a similar phenomena, but it's so inflected by age. So once you, once you factor in age, um, labor uh, suddenly do quite a bit better than it looks so once you exclude all the retired part of the uh, working class vote, if you like, or the what, you, what would traditionally be, be part of, considered part of the working class vote, Labour gets much more competitive in the last two elections. So it's very much an older pensioner uh, element. And I suppose that argument does potentially lend some support for Anne. I think Anne probably goes a bit too far in the argument about um, middle, the middle class is losing out from the globalization for my test taste, but it does lend a bit of support to it because, you know, pensioners have been very, very economically protected under the conservatives compared to everyone else. You've had, they've had the triple lock, you know, it's a classic kind of you know, a really going in an almost opportunistic way um, for the grey vote. And so uh, if I was being sort of, yes, yes, this is in the picture, you know, yes, I think you see all of the, the, the authoritarianism that this government is doing, it's very real. If we're being optimistic, the generational divides that exist in the UK do nonetheless pose a problem for the Tories going forward. And interestingly, that's not, it's not the same in the rest of Europe. You know, we don't get a really big age divide. So the phenomenon of the young far rightist is an absolutely a phenomenon in Poland and Hungary and elsewhere. So it's, it's it, yeah, Britain is unusual on that score. Can I just come in on here? Because I, I want to argue that actually um, <clears throat> what Britain represents is a phenomenon that's it's widespread across Western states, which is the collapse of social democracy. I mean, social democracy in Europe is almost non-existent. In France, the socialists have been decimated. Um, same in Greece. In, it, in Spain, they're very weak. There seems to be some revival in Germany, but that is unusual. And social democracy in the United States is very weak. As, as the Clinton results showed. So, you know, I, I don't think that's different here. I think what's happened is 
working people see social democracy as aligned to the globalization process. All you have to think about is Tony Blair and Wall Street and Peter Mandelson and Wall Street. This is how labor is per was perceived and correctly perceived in my view as having sold out to Wall Street, having sold out to global financial capital. And, you know, so that was understood in my view by the public, uh, even though it was never explicitly spelled out by social democrats themselves who, who, who have a blind spot for their role in supporting this globalization project. So I think you've got to see Britain in that context you, as an alienation and that's what makes it so tragic at the moment to see Blair and Mandelson back, if you like, in the saddle, the Labour Party saddle, uh, because it is precise, it was precisely their alignment with globalization which caused uh, the Labour Party to lose elections. I agree, and I think it was also the case in the 1930s, the weakness of social democracy mm. was a hugely important factor. But Portugal is quite optimistic. Anyway, and maybe Biden is being better on the domestic front than he is on we the international so. front. Yeah. But then again, <laughs> while Biden is, he's undermined by Munchen, is he called Munchen, the, you know, the, the one senator that has leverage over the, the, the infrastructure deal. And so we see social democrats actually undermining a project which would, you know, restore, restore some substantive empowerment to the working people of the United States. Priya, did you want to add to this? Um, not especially, other than to reiterate my point about us needing to think about democracy in more substantive ways. And one of the things that we do need to talk about in talking about hegemony is how consent is elicited. And we certainly saw this with you know, uh, the media, the British media and Corbyn, but yeah. we see this with the British yeah. media and many other things is that there is a bedrock of myth-making and falsehood. And that is what, and I would say this, I guess, as, as a literature uh, a, a scholar, that it, you know, th these are the texts that elicit and make consent and manufacture consent. And so we do need to be thinking about the absence of critical education, the absence of substantive em empowerment, as, as Luke put it, and how one breaks this consent making to global, you know, to, to, to authoritarianism uh, and xenophobia at such a massive scale, uh, because it, it isn't just self-interest operating each class voting according to its interests. These classes are not voting according to their interests and the consent is elicited on the basis of mythologies. And yeah. how, how do we approach that? The question of meaningful democracy as opposed to majoritarianism. Mm -hmm. Gosh, that is all so interesting. I'm going to allow this Russian question. Today, people in Russia woke up to the outcome of the heavily rigged parliamentary elections. Do you think Putin's Russia, which is becoming more and more authoritarian, totalitarian even, falls into this category as well? Well, I'm sure you're going to say yes, Luke. It, this is probably for you. Yes, I mean, <laughs> uh, um, I think what makes Putin and uh, there's another question around Donbass as well. Uh, uh, you oh, know, I think I've... yeah, which uh, where sorry, I, we, but basically, I think what makes Putin, you know, p particularly um, dangerous is that he's consolidated hegemony, if you like, at home or dominance at home very clearly through a combination of uh, yeah, yeah, mobilizing it nationalist mobilizing ideology but also being quite shameless about his willingness to rig elections the last election by the way um, it, you, Tim Schneider talks about it in his book on uh, that has freedom in the title I can't remember the title right now but you can find it online uh, Putin, he, he he has a nice discussion in that book about how how Putin openly stole the last election um, mm -hmm. and, and made jokes about it on national television. So it was, a, it was a completely shameless exercise. And I suppose what 
uh, he has done over the last decade externally is you know hugely significant on this score because uh, I think he's unusual in, if you're finding I uh, as I, I say in the book and Priya mentioned earlier I don't think we should analyze this issue in terms of the democracies against the authoritarians no 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 um, however clearly Putin is quite unusual in his willingness to project and use military power um, overseas. He was crucial to Assad's uh, victory in Syria. Obviously, we have the intervention um, in the Ukraine. And as US power has declined, you know, he has seized this opportunity to carve out a kind of new Russian power that draws on the Russian state's military strength in spite of its economic um, weakness and you know clearly that's very dangerous it's also very different I think written in substance to how the Chinese regime uh, behaves in international relations. Is it so different I mean look at what the Chinese have done on the Indian border in the South China Sea are they about to attack Taiwan? Uh, I hope not um, I, I remember sharing. I, sh I remember sharing a, a great foreign affairs article with you a few years ago that I encourage people to read, um, Mary, uh, which is basically put, points out uh, that um, Taiwan has a very good. I, I very much hope it doesn't happen. I'm totally opposed to any Western power getting involved if it does happen. But this article points out that you know Taiwan would have a, a strong chance of militarily defeating um, China uh, if, if, if China did invade. We shouldn't assume that China, a Chinese invasion of Taiwan will simply be a victory for Xi Jinping. It's incredibly risk-prone um, exercise and might even be the event that leads to the downfall of his regime. One of the, ma the main reason for that is that the scale of the military build-up that would be needed uh, would give Taiwan about six months notice in which time they could cut off all of their economic capital to China and they could place mines all over the Taiwanese Strait. totally opposed to it happening and uh, by oh, clearly Taiwan has a, has a right to defend itself if it does happen um, and yeah I, I suppose what I meant more is that certainly in terms of how the kind of ideology of Chinese international relations is extremely non-interventionist. And yes, in Taiwan, in the South China Sea, that does look a lot like intervention. Um, however, they would see it as their backyard. And they would say, well, look, we're not, we're just defending East Asia here. It's the Americans who shouldn't be here. They should be on the other side of the Pacific. I suppose where Russia is different is that there is really quite a substantial projection of military might into the Middle East. Um, so we, it's specifically in Syria that marks it out as quite different. Yeah, I suppose so. Although I think Crimea and uh, Ossetia are very kind of good examples of backyard thinking. But anyway, that leads to, I think, what is probably the last question, which is addressed to Anne, but I think all of you. Um, and actually, I'd add to that question. How is the autonomous capitalist machine going to end up? Are we approaching a crisis, whether it's technology, inequality, or geopolitical affairs, e.g. what we've been talking about? What Actually, I think we're in the middle of crises, but don't let me anticipate what people are going to say. But I thought we could actually add to that. Um, Priya ended her initial talk on a sort of note of hope. So I think my where I would add to that is where is the hope? Where are the opportunities for, or for change in a different direction? Because we haven't really talked about that. And I'll start with Anne. So, um, uh, you know, I'm uh, famous for being uh, bearish about all of this, uh, but like you, Mary, I think we're right in the middle of crises. Um, you know, the, the supply chain crisis is extraordinary. And that's because we've so expanded the uh, these long supply chains that, and for example, we've built a uh, huge ships, huge container ships for moving trade across uh, across the seas, and while that's 
you know, enabled much more trade to take place. Just unloading these ships requires an enormous amount of labor and time. And we're seeing right now these enormous uh, container ships lining up outside, not just uh, the, 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 the ports of China, but also the United States and not being unloaded. Um, and the pandemic is part of the reason for that. But it just shows you how fragile are these supply chains and how close will they are to break, they are breaking. And then, of course, we have the implosion of Evergrande, the uh, property company in China, which has built up enormous corporate debt um, and not not domestic Chinese debt, but of course, globalized uh, dollar denominated debt. And they're not alone. You know, the world is awash with corporate debt. The, the next crisis will be in the corporate sector, not in the household sector. Um, but like you, I want to be I want to be optimistic. And I and that is why whenever I talk about it, I talk about the way in which the Roosevelt in, uh, administration of 1933 in, in steps which are on the whole obscured by historians and economists. On the night of his inauguration, um, Roosevelt dispossessed Wall Street, dismantled Wall Street. It's often described as, you know, fixing the banks. But in fact, what he did was to dismantle the international gold standard, which was the globalization of the day, and to restore autonomy and authority over the economy to the government, which had been democratically elected. Now, how that autonomy and that, that, that power was used is questionable, and we can argue with it. And there was quite a lot, there was a lot wrong about what the Roosevelt administration did. But what for me is all powerful is the, the recollection that it was possible in 1933 with the rise of Hitler and Nazism for a democratic state to to overpower the financial system and to uh, shift power from Wall Street to, to Washington. And um, so I take that, that's what the Green New Deal is based on. It's based on the recollection of how we've done it in the past. And so, you know, because there's great sense of powerlessness that, that this great system is beyond us. And, and that's exactly what they like us to think. Whereas fact, as we saw through the pandemic and through the great financial crisis, Wall Street is almost wholly 100% dependent on the power of a public institution financed by taxpayers that is called the Federal Reserve. And without the Federal Reserve, Wall Street will be bankrupt, would be bankrupt. And thanks to the Federal Reserve, Wall Street was effectively nationalized in March 2020 when the shadow banking system imploded in, in ways that were very simpler, similar to 2007 8. Again, that's history that's already been obscured from us, but it happened only a year ago. Um, and, and it was rescued by public financial institutions. So that's what gives me hope that actually, if we just rediscover our power, over this, this sector, we discover how dependent this sector is on us taxpayers for the value of our currencies, for the power of our central banks, then we can begin to demand terms and conditions, if you like, and exercise le leverage over the sector. So I'm optimistic. <laughs> That's wonderful. Priya. Yeah, I, um, I'll say two things. Um, and skirt the issue of optimism. Um, I think we need to understand that, especially given the global climate crisis, but also given where capital exercises power, any change has to be on a global scale. It can't be Wall Street and the US president. We have to move away from America-obsessed agency. Mm -hmm. Agency has to be global. Brazil is powerful. Russia is powerful. India is powerful. China is powerful. South Africa coming along. Capital it does not only reside on Wall Street. And capitalism's depredations are global. And for me, it is the agency and resistance of young people across the globe, and not just, say, Occupy Wall Street, uh, that is going to be needed if we are going to find solutions on a global scale. And the people who give me some hope 
are the young people who are climate activists and who are raising the alarm and are raising the alarm on a global scale. And I, I hope that that will amount to the global dismantling of a clearly very, very lethal system that is operating in lethally in, in many different ways on a global scale. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm so glad you introduced the climate crisis because that was one of the questions we didn't answer. Sorry to the questioner. And now to Luke. Yeah, well, I think in the end, it's hard to be an optimist when you're facing such a deep crisis. I mean, climate emissions are still going up, as the United Nations reminded us just a week or so ago, uh, didn't they? So, you know, we're, we're nowhere near the level of climate action that we need. And I think I, I can, in terms of the political, the political horizon has to be internationalist and global to, to resist these forces. And, you know, I think Priya is absolutely right when she talks about, and I've seen her, you know, say this online too, where, well, look, the, the great powers of the world in the, at the end of the 21st century are very unlikely to be uh, the West. And mm -hmm. I think that uh, clearly, like, changes how maybe the le a lot of the left in the West maybe thinks about their, their internationalism. For a long time, it was... Well, we support the global south against the United States. Well, hang on a minute. The whole world order is is transforming in this much more multi-layered, complicated way. And authoritarian globalization, if you like, is emerging as part of this um, picture. And, you know, to partially contradict what I, I said uh, a moment ago about Chinese foreign policy, you know, in this century, you could easily imagine the Chinese state being drawn in to America-like um, in, in, in imperialist-esque interventions, particularly in Africa, for example. You could almost scope out how that would work. You know, China is such a huge investor um, in the DRC mineral trade, for example, a very conflict-inflicted society. The conflict tensions in that part of the world, unfortunately, if we're betting on it, we're, we're going to anticipate them getting worse because of climate change, because of the ecological effects, because of the way global financialization is driving money to armed groups and so on. So all of this cacophony of factors points to, to quite potentially quite negative outcomes. And you could easily imagine in that situation, what if there were 20 Chinese engineers taken as hostage by an armed group or something, China being drawn in um, to intervention. So the whole way in which global power is operating um, is transforming. And I suppose if my, I, I, well, I think absolutely we have to have the internationalist horizon. I think in a way the, the, the level of change need, and it needs to be as international as possible. Um, but if we can't get international change, we will have to, if you like, have survival strategies uh, for the local level, whether that's helping uh, refugees fee fleeing climate catastrophe or armed violence, uh, whether that's protecting our public uh, what's left of our public sector and fighting for more investment on a local level. We have to have these kind of local strategies in tandem with, with, the, with the global vision, if you like. Thank you so much, everybody. And we could have gone on for ages. I just wanted to add one thing to what you've all just said, which is that this is the reason why I am so incredibly committed to democratization of the European Union, because I think the European Union is a new kind of semi-internationalist organization and the only one that has the possibility of influencing the international system given the authoritarian protectionist nature of all the others. That's my one little point I want to make. But other than that, it was a brilliant discussion and we could have gone on for ages and ages. Here is Luke's book and you can see the link in the chat. And thank you very, very much everybody uh, for a wonderful discussion and hope to see you again soon. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank Bye. you. Bye. 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 Bye.